Five years ago, I was trying to redesign my international business course. At that time, I had been teaching for a few years, and it had become obvious to me that teaching international business through lectures in a classroom, it's like teaching how to swim on a football field. <laughs> you know, you have to get in the water to learn how to swim. And to understand international business, you must have that international experience. So I was trying to find a way to add that international component to my course, and it's not easy when your university happens to be in a small town in North Carolina. You just don't have much international going on. And then I had what I thought a brilliant idea. I thought, what if I could find a professor in a different country who teaches a similar course, and maybe we can take our students and put them in international teams, and they would deal with the time zone differences, with the language barriers, with cultural differences, that would be a real international experience. And I didn't know how to find a professor like that, so one day, it was July of 2010, I just simply sent out an email through the Academy of International Business, just trying to see if anyone wants to team up with me. So it was towards the end of my working day, I went home, I had my dinner, played with my kids, and then before going to bed, I checked my emails, dozens and dozens of responses from all around the world. And if you fast forward five years, today, that one email five years ago has become what we call now the X Culture Project. So every single semester, the X Culture Project attracts about 4,000 MBA students, business students from over 100 universities, over 40 countries, all six continents represented. Huge, huge crowd. And so we take those people and we put them in global virtual teams. Usually it's about seven people per team, each person from a different country. And so they work for a semester together, they communicate every day, they basically work like real corporate international project teams. They use the same tools like Dropbox, Google Docs, uh, Basecamp, Skype, real deal. And um, as they do that, they learn international business, they experience it. Now, in the early stages of the project, the first maybe two years or so, the students would work on the hypothetical international business case study. But then as the project became bigger, as it became more known, real companies started coming to us with real-life problems. Like, for example, Home Depot. Home Depot was asking for help, for ideas, for how to improve their dot-com services. Or, for example, Mercedes-Benz. So they were asking for how to design trucks for developing countries. Or Louis Vuitton, the guys who make luxury bags and, you know, fashion style, they were asking for ideas, for suggestions, for the best locations for their new stores around the planet, and then how to design those stores to make them most appealing to the customers. All kinds of other companies, dozens and dozens of them, usually the challenge is help us with developing strategy for entering new markets. All the way from identifying the most promising markets, and then um, best entry mode, find maybe retailers, partners, develop the strategy for promoting and marketing the products in that market, uh, financing, staffing, the whole thing. Whatever the company needs to know to be successful in that new market. So I found myself in this situation where originally all I wanted to do is to give my students an experiential project. But then I found myself sitting on this treasure, on this huge resource, you know, all those bright minds, thousands of them from all around the world. On the one hand, they are there, and then on the other hand, I have real companies asking for real help. And so, initially I was just an instructor, but then I basically found myself dealing with crowdsourcing. So my job, my big question has become, how do I take this crowd and organize them towards solving problems around solving problems for those companies? And I'll be honest with you, I was originally a little skeptical about the students' ability to solve business problems. Uh, <laughs> I had read enough papers to know that some of them are not impressive. You all know the Sturgeon's Law, right? 90% of everything is crap. And so, when you read student papers, it is true. <laughs> but the remarkable thing is, the remarkable thing is that the remaining 10% actually are very, very good. In fact, some of the solutions produced by the students are so good, they impress the client companies so much that we always have cases when companies hire authors of the best ideas right on the spot. So, now the question is, how can students, all those, you know, amateur, inexperienced people, be so good at solving problems? When you look at us as humans, we are actually not really that good or not that remarkable. We may be the most successful species on this planet collectively, but individually we are nothing special. We are not the toughest, we are not the fastest, we are not the strongest, we may not even be the smartest. Like, look at this video. Can you memorize 
so many numbers in a split second and sort them from the smallest to the largest? Like, I know I can't. <laughs> in fact, if you take that ape, that chimp, and put one chimp and one human on an island, who do you think are going to survive? <laughs> Obviously, the chimp has a better chance of surviving. But then take 1,000 humans and 1,000 apes. Who's going to survive now? I bet on humans. When you look at human history, we've had a few inflection points where we dramatically improved our productivity. First and foremost, it was the Industrial Revolution, right? The arrival of the machines allowed us to go beyond the limits of the muscle power, our own muscles, the muscles of the animals we domesticated. So we were able to increase producti <coughs> productivity. We were able to increase comfort of our lives. We pretty much doubled our life expectancy in a matter of a century. Then came the computing revolution, the 80s of the last uh, century. So if the industrial revolution allowed us to go beyond the limits of this, the computing revolution allowed us to go beyond the limits of this, the cognitive limitations. So we now can do millions, billions of computations per second. But the most amazing, the most important revolution is going on right now, and that's the social revolution. All of a sudden, we can connect with anyone on this planet at virtually zero marginal cost. Not some big guys with the technology, like anyone. Like you, you can take your smartphone and you can connect to anyone on this planet. If before, large-scale projects involved, what, thousands, maybe tens of thousands of people, now we can collaborate in hundreds of millions, like literally hundreds of millions. And not any hundreds of millions, very diverse global crowds. Uh, if you look at, for example, the Egyptian pyramids, yes, they were built by many people, probably tens of thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands. But all of those peop people came from the same geographic location. They were of the same cultural background, so they were very similar. Now you can, help, can have very, very diverse crowds, and this is a big deal, that will have a dramatic impact on how we do business, how we make decisions. Now, admittedly, we waste that wonderful connectivity primarily on this. <coughs> but we already have great examples of when mass-scale mass collaboration has been used very successfully. Like, for example, Wikipedia. It took the amateur crowd-powered Wikipedia only a few years to literally displace, to kill the 250-year-old expert-powered Encyclopedia Britannica. Big deal. Or, for example, Linux, the open-source operating system that relies on amateurs to write the code. They beat such professional giants like Microsoft, like Google, like Apple, in the number of software sectors. Like, for example, server software, Linux is the king there. Now, the success of Linux and Wikipedia lies in their ability to take a very, very large project and split it in many, many, many small independent tasks. Like, for example, you can make a valuable contribution to Wikipedia in a matter of a minute. You can log in, you see a problem with an article, you can improve that article without having to read the rest of Wikipedia. In fact, you don't even have to read the rest of the article. That's a big deal. The question is, can you use crowds equally effectively to solve big, complex business problems where you must have that big picture? Well, that's what I've been studying. So with Exculture, I have this wonderful opportunity to subject the crowd to different experimental conditions, to see what works and what doesn't. And so we do a lot of research. And so my research so far shows that even the most primitive crowdsourcing models actually can be very effective. Uh, if you use the most primitive model that I call the freelancer model, so all you do is just broadcast your challenge to the world and then hope people will bring you solutions. As long as the crowd working on that problem is large enough and diverse enough, there is a very good chance somebody in that crowd will know something you don't know, will maybe have some insider information, maybe will have a solution that you would never develop internally in your own company. So even that can work very well. The problem with this model is that it can only be as good as the best individual in the crowd. It can only give you the solution thought of by the best individual in the crowd, which may be not bad, but it's the limit. That's it. Like, look at, for example, this video here. So here we see three regular guys do something that even the most elite athletes on this planet cannot do individually. So this is what we want. We want that synergy where the group can do better than the best individual in the team. And research in this area, by the way, has been going on for quite some time. I'm not the first one. So a typical classical example or experiment in this area would be one that goes like this. The scientist would have a problem, like, for example, find as many uses as possible for a plastic bag. <coughs> and then they would take the subject, the experiment subjects, and, for example, they would take a group of 10 people. 
and they would put those 10 people in 10 different rooms and give them this task. Normally, an individual will come up with about 10 to 25 unique ideas for how to use that Walmart bag. But then because some of the ideas are repetitive across the individuals in the group, a group of 10 will give you about 40 unique ideas. Then take same group and put them in one room. That will almost double the productivity. Why? Well, because you say something that gives me an idea, I say something that gives you an idea, and before we know it, we are talking about things that we would have never even thought about on our own. So this is what we want. This is exactly the question that we have in Xculture. Now, the good, question, I mean, the good news is that uh, when you deal with crowds, with these complex systems, even the smallest change in the process often can dramatically, dramatically improve the results. In fact, let me illustrate the importance of the process using this simple installation here. Um, over here, I have one big professional grade light bulbs. O over here, I have a crowd of small, unremarkable light bulbs. Which of the two do you think are going to shine brighter? Well, let's try. All right. Clearly, the expert light bulb wins, right? Now, let me change a little bit how these small light bulbs interact with one another. So we have the same power input. We have the same light bulbs. We have a little different process. Very different result. Now, the physicists have figured out the difference between the serial and the parallel wiring a long time ago, right? So that's what I'm trying to figure out for humans, for crowds of people. How do you organize a crowd in a way that they are most productive, that they generate the best ideas? And in Xculture, we started off with a very simple, very primitive model, uh, the freelancer model. So we would just have hundreds of those teams, thousands of MBA students trying to solve the problems, and we would just hope that somebody will bring an interesting solution. And they often do. But then we found you know, that if you tweak the process a little bit, you can actually improve the, uh, the, the outcomes very much. Like, for example, in Xculture, every week there is a deadline, and every week there is a deliverable, like an intermediate report. And so all those files, when they get submitted, they end up in a folder on my computer. We found that if you take that folder and give access to everyone to that folder, productivity goes way up. People see what others are working on. They learn from those ideas. They build upon those ideas. They take them to the next level. And so the final product improves very much for everyone. The problem with this model, we found, is that it's too noisy. When you have thousands of participants, there is just too much going on. And it's impossible to keep track of all the developments. So another very interesting refinement was uh, trying to evaluate the quality of those submissions in real time. So they come in, we evaluate them, and we not only share them, but we also rate them and people see the ratings. So this way, they can focus on the best ideas and try to learn from the best ideas. Or another very promising um, um, model of crowdsourcing, uh, I call it the survival of the fittest. So in addition to rating those submissions, we would also kind of discard the ones that are not very good and promote to the next week's round only the best 10, 20 percent. So by doing so, you kind of preclude the waste of time, the waste of effort on ideas that have no promise and only promote the best ones to the next round. So you kind of survival of the fittest. Again, great results. We're testing a, a number of models, and so probably we'll spend another year or so on, on testing them. And I don't know which one's going to win. Uh, but the plan is, once we have a model that is strong enough, that is good enough, we actually want to face off with the real professional business consultants. The plan is that we will take a real big-name consulting company, hire them to do the same task that the crowd does, and then the crowd will do the same thing. And then when the reports are submitted, we will remove the title pages, uh, no names, and we will submit both solutions to the client, and then ask, select, which one do you think is better? My research so far makes me very hopeful. I think the crowd actually will have a good chance of w at winning. Competitions like that, uh, like that haven't been done before, but you all probably have seen who wants to be a millionaire, right? And so there, the player can choose the lifelines. And so we know statistically when the player chooses as the audience, you know, as the crowd, the crowd is correct about 91% of the time. But when the player chooses the line uh, called call the, friend, uh, the friend or called the expert, the experts are correct only about half of the time. So, yeah, there is a difference there. Now, I would like to leave you with a prediction. I predict that in the nearest future, we will see a rapid growth, a rapid reliance on uh, crowds rather than professionals. Just like today, you go to wikipedia.org for answers, right? You don't go to britannica.com anymore. The managers of the future will also go to crowds and not to professional consultants. 
if I were in charge of a big consulting company, I would be very worried. In fact, I would be trying and working very hard at trying to incorporate that experiential, that, that, that crowd element into my consulting model. Because if you don't, one morning, very soon, you will wake up and you will find your business obsolete. These are exciting times. We are going through a major revolution in our ability to connect to large groups of people. This has ne happened never before, and you can actually benefit from this right now. You can, for example, join a crowd. There are a number of crowdsourcing platforms out there, and you can log in and you can see what challenges are posted and maybe submit your solution. In fact, if you do a good job, they will even pay you. Or if you run a business, if anyone runs a business, maybe consider going to a crowd next time you have a problem, not to the consultants. The crowd will cost you much, more, uh, much less, and there is a very good chance they will actually produce a, a very good solution that will surprise you. Or maybe you can develop your own platform. We have a number of crowdsourcing platforms, but uh, they still use that outdated freelancer model. Maybe you can do better. So don't miss this revolution, because these are exciting times. Great opportunities. Thank you.